Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. And if you want to open your camera so we can see you. Hello, hello, everyone. Great, so uh, we might get started then, if, if that's okay, Alejandra. It's okay, and Karen. Are you happy to, to leave people in as, as they arrive, if, if, that, if that's okay? So I'm going to begin by asking everybody to, to mute your, your microphones, if that's okay. And, um, but do leave on your cameras, and especially for our interactive discussion session a little bit later on. So... Um, I'm going to start by saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good, a good night to you all. Um, my name is Tiana O'Sullivan. I'm from University College Dublin in Ireland, and it gives me great pleasure to co-chair the Youth 21 SDG initiative this year with my colleague, Dr. Jane Nichol from University of Birmingham. I wish to extend a very warm welcome to you all to today's annual forum, which is really a highlight um, for our group and our group's activities. And I want to begin by a, a special thank you to Dr. To Tech de Monterey for hosting um, the meeting this week and for our forum today. And a special thank you to Dr. Sandra Car uh, Cardenas, Veronica Fernandez and Alejandra Tamiris as well who have given us a huge amount of help and support to get organized. So um, who are we? Um, okay, sorry, just, um, so who are we? We are a group of academics and student representatives from across the Universitas 21 network. We have a new committee, so I don't have everybody's photo available, unfortunately, um, but we um, come up from a, a wide variety of the U21 uh, network, and we represent um, a, a diverse group of health science disciplines as well. Our purpose of the group is really to promote knowledge and understanding of the sustainable development goals within health science curricula. The Sustainable Development Goals are really a blueprint and a call for action to in ensure peace and prosperity for people and the planet today and always. And we work in a number of ways and undertake a number act of activities to realise our objectives and our goals. You're going to hear about these activities during these sessions and, and in the sessions throughout the day, but I'm just going to give you a very, very quick summary of some of our activities over the last year. It is true to say that the students and the student group are really the heartbeat of our activities and we have a very dynamic um, um, student group that was led last year by Nikki Goldman from the University of Glasgow. Um, the student group um, organised a fantastic student awareness week back in March. It involved participation and leadership from students from five of the network universities. Uh, they had over 200 participants during the week. They had up to three events each day crossing uh, four different time zones. And key themes and topics covered included climate emergency, and vaccine inequity, um, and technology in healthcare. We're going to hear more about the student group activity in, during this session. The U21 SDG initiative um, has also had a global learning partnership up and running for the last number of years. And this year it was uh, conducted online. Um, and uh, really this is a partnership with University of Kathmandu in Nepal. And we're going to hear a little bit more about that from students and from uh, Carlin Cracknell from University of Melbourne in a moment. But it was hugely successful. It ran for four weeks online it involves students from four, from eight different universities and from eight different uh, health science disciplines. Learning was, was supported by eight, by eight project mentors 
and from 18 staff from across the U21 network and University of Kathmandu also. The group also has a number of case studies um, that are available online and you can view many of them online. And this year, the group also developed a new case study um, on, uh, about gender-based violence. And these case studies are used in our SDG students workshops. They're used during the, the GLP. And they're also used by different members of the health sciences group. And they've proven to be a very valuable uh, tool during the, the online teaching aspect of the pandemic. And finally, the group has, has published various articles and publications over the last few years. And I'm delighted to say that uh, just last week, we have um, a, a publication published by the group and led by Dr. Vicky Burns from the University of Birmingham. Um, and this article was about the role of university education in driving equality and sustainability. And it was written in advance of the UN climate change meeting to be held in Glasgow this year. And seven um, authors, are, uh, the authors came from seven of the university, University of 21 uh, universities and included students as well. And the article is part of an, an initiative by the University of Birmingham to ensure that universities enact our distinctive role as civic institutions and contribute to important public debate. The article will be shared with politicians and policy makers and will be shared widely on social media. And I will share the link to the article on the chat box later in this session. And our final, um, our final activity it brings me to what we're, is, is our annual forum, and that is uh, today's event. And again, I'm delighted and, and wish to extend my thanks to Tech de Monterey for um, hosting our annual forum today. We have a really exciting program for you. During this hour, we're going to hear from students and some of our university staff on activities over the last year and how they contribute to advocating for the SDGs. We have an excellent keynote session about the impact of COVID-19 and, and global vaccine inequity and the impact of this on the SDGs. And our speakers are Professor Rafaelwe Mafuya Baswana from the University of Johannesburg, and Professor Manuel Perez from Tech de Monterey. And our final session um, today is we will hear from me different members of the U21 network about the impact of COVID-19 and how it has changed um, our teaching um, in terms of the SDGs. Uh, we love to get new members and more universities involved. And if you want more information on our group, you can find it in the web link here. And if you're interested in, in joining the group, please contact Karina, who's our operations manager. So again, um, I am now going to hand you over to my colleague, Suzanne Brockup from University of Lund from Lund University, who is going to facilitate our first session today. Thank you, Suzanne, and it's over to you. Thank you, Cleona, and um, I too say welcome to you all. And it's nice to have you here and I'm happy to meet a lot of friends, if only by digital technology, but it's so good to see you all. Um, I'm going to present to you the fantastic students that we have in this group and all over the world. Uh, they never cease to amaze me in any ways. It's, they are so good at what they do and the presentations you're gonna hear will show that to you. Uh, we're gonna to listen to two presentations, two videos. Uh, the first one is about the SDGs Awareness Week. And the second one is about the Global Learning Partnership, which both events were successfully digital this year. And in the first video, you will listen to a couple of students, uh, namely five of them. Uh, Hayato Miki from University of Melbourne, Mapaseka Dolu from University of Johannesburg, Sofia Suniga from Tech de Monterey, Kirsty Craig from University of Glasgow, and Amanda Tan from University of Melbourne. And um, they're going to present to you the work they did on the Digital Awareness Week uh, 2021, which was such an amazing event and so very well performed. And I have to mention and send a big thanks to, to um, uh, Nikki as well, who actually held it all together. Suddenly forgot her second name or her surname. 
Can anyone help me? Nikki? Goldman, Nikki Goldman. Gold. Good, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, so sorry, Nikki, if you're here. Uh, so, um, Alejandra, you can press the button and start the video. Enjoy. Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. And thank you all for this opportunity this is to share briefly one, about the SDG yeah. Group Initiative for Global Learning Partnership. My name is Carolyn and I'm the project officer for the U21 Global Learning Partnership Program. And I'd like to share briefly about running the program online this year before hearing from two of our students who joined us as we implemented the program across July and August. Many of you will know the Global Learning Partnership Program is designed to provide both staff and students with opportunity to work collaboratively across international universities with the intent of learning about and developing initiatives to support the UN SDGs. This has always been a great opportunity for global mobility for U21 students. However, with the current pandemic, the international travel was not possible. So in reviewing the GLP program, we recognised there was great opportunity to still transfer this model online and hold true to the core elements that make the GLP program. That is the respectful partnerships as an SDG focus, ensuring that we have local, international and culturally diverse cohort, providing interprofessional collaboration opportunities and ensuring that we have action oriented learning across the four weeks of the program. To do this, we continue to work closely with our partners at Kathmandu University School of Medical Sciences. This meant designing the program with staff from KUSMS we also ensured that we were recruiting students from both U21 member universities along with KUSMS. The program ran ent entirely online with content being delivered face-to-face -face via Zoom, face-to-face -face group mentoring, independent group work and independent reading. Each student was allocated to a health promotion project group. Each project group was allocated a different health health-related topic that was identified by KUSMS as relevant to the staff or community in Dulakel, Nepal. Each group had an interprofessional mix of students who were to work together to develop a resource that address addresses an identified need of the community related to that health topic area. Across the four groups, the health project topics included low back pain management, hypertension and stroke prevention, menopause symptom management, and sports nutrition for local athletes. This year we had 32 students, 17 from U21 and 15 from KUSMS. Across the students, we had eight different health science disciplines represented, as well as eight different U21 member universities represented in the 17 U21 students. Teaching and project activity was scaffolded across the four weeks to support the development of the education resource to be developed. This was supported by eight project mentors with expertise in the health topic area. Along with this was 18 additional staff members from U21 and KUSMS contributing to presentations and workshops. We also had the privilege of previous GLP students contributing to student learning across the four weeks. I'd like to take a moment to thank every one of those staff members who contributed to the learning across the four weeks. Each group completed the program by delivering a health promotion education resource for local staff or community members to use. These included pamphlets, posters and videos. Students reported back having a meaningful learning opportunity and found that it was influenced their future practice. We were also able to receive constructive feedback regarding the workload, preparation material and content delivery. I'm excited for you to hear from two of our wonderful students who joined us in the program so they can share more about their experience during the GLP program. Thank you. So my friends, that was a slight mix up. We should have seen the other video first, but we're gonna continue seeing the GLP video now. So just 
Listen up. And Suzanne, do you want me to, to put the part no, B? No. Please continue. Not a big problem. Okay. No. Hi everyone, I'm Delarome and I'm a Master of Public Health student from University of Melbourne. Hi, I'm Lena and I'm a medical student from the University of Birmingham. So we're really excited to share our experience with the Global Learning Partnership with you today. We learned so many things from this experience, but here are just a few things. We learned about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and their specific targets, as well as how we can implement these into our own lives. We also discussed leadership and advocacy, which really inspired a lot of us. During the GLP, we also gained valuable skills on how to utilize health need assessment to design more meaningful health programs for the community. We also gained research skills, which included both quantitative and qualitative methodology. And lastly, we learned about health promotion and ways we can evaluate our programs effectively. Now, both Lena and I are going to share a bit about our projects with you. The project that I was involved in aimed to understand the mental and physical health impact of menopause on Nepalese women. Whilst there's not enough time to explain all aspects of the project, I'm going to briefly touch on some aspects that I learned a lot from. In the screenshots on the top right, you can see the picture of my team. I'm sharing this screenshot because one of the highlights for me personally was having the ability to work with a diverse team who are not only from different healthcare disciplines, but also from different countries and cultures. This experience allowed us to look at the same issue more holistically and from different perspectives. This is something that we are often not exposed to as students unless we actively engage in a global health project like GLP. After literature search and consultations with supervisors, we prepared our data collection questions. We interviewed 10 women in the community over Zoom, and you can see a screenshot of one of the interviews at the bottom right. Depending on participants' language proficiency, at times our Nepalese colleagues had to act as our interpreters, which added a layer of complexity that I personally learned a lot from. Being a public health student, I have had the opportunity to learn about various theories like strength-based approaches and program implementation. However, GLP gave us an opportunity to employ our learnings and see our project come to life. The quantitative and qualitative analysis of our findings highlighted that there were some gaps in knowledge and some myths around menopause among the community. However, this was not due to women's fault, but rather a systemic societal barriers that does not prioritize women's health. This is something that we also see in most countries around the world. We could appreciate that despite many limitations, Nepalese women are resourceful and resilient. So we used our finding to design a program that meets the needs of the women in the community by working with the women themselves. Women themselves had identified that firstly, they had never been given a resource about menopause, but they were interested to learn more about it. Secondly, while some women wanted to know basic information, some were eager to learn about menopause in more detail. And lastly, almost all women told us that they wished their families were more understanding and that they were more aware of what they were experiencing. So all of those findings um, led us to have our health promotion phase one program. So the phase one of our health promotion project was designed um, to have three pamphlets. The first one included basic information that was explained with more pictures and illustrations. The second pamphlet included more detailed explanation of menopause and ways to manage symptoms. And the third pamphlet was designed for women's families and their partners to gain better understanding of menopause and ways they can be more supportive of women. This slide also shows that all of their pamphlets were translated in Nepalese. The pamphlets also included um, a QR code, so they could be accessed online as well. As a second phase of our program, we had in-person education sessions. Our Nepalese colleagues used the pamphlets and ran small education sessions for the community. You can see glimpses of these sessions on the screen. This was done in an informal setting and in a small scale due to the pandemic restrictions. But the plan is to upscale these sessions when there is an opportunity for community gatherings in the future. But in the meantime, we have planned to continue to disseminate the flyers 
during the home and hospital visits. This was an overview of my project and I would like to now pass on to Lena to share about her project. So for my project, we explored self-beliefs and self-management amongst people experiencing lower back pain in Nepal. So to learn more, we conducted interviews with the local population experiencing lower back pain over Zoom. And there are some photos of this experience on the screen here. This for me was so valuable for my learning because we had to overcome language barriers, translations and internet problems to achieve our goal. From this research and the interviews, we found some common themes. So we found that people in Nepal mostly use rest to improve their lower back pain, which usually isn't a recommended strategy. And they also felt that their condition couldn't improve significantly over time due to restrictions from duties at work or duties at home. These thoughts led to a lot of our participants feeling hopeless. So for our health promotion project, we really wanted to address all these points that the participants had brought up. We decided to make an informative self-help guide in the form of a flyer, which can be seen on the screen. And we also made a video. Both these resources were provided in English and Nepali to maximize accessibility. In our resources, we wanted to highlight the message of staying active to improve lower back pain. And we also wanted to give people hope and let them know that their pain could improve over time. So next slide, please. Thank you. In the long term, we really want to reduce the impact of lower back pain on the local population. Obviously, this is a very big task, but we're hoping that making the local population aware of effective self-management strategies will empower them and allow them to take control of their own health and improve their health status over time. We were actually able to share our resources with some of the interview participants and the feedback was really positive. People understood the messages we were trying to give and were particularly focused on the stay active advice. They said they really wanted to try this. This feedback made us all so happy because we could see that the we could see the potential that our project had. So just to finish off our short presentation, we want to share a few final words and take home messages. Firstly, make friends. We've all gotten along so well on a personal and professional level. This goes for all of the groups. It's been really wonderful for all of us to develop these connections. And without the relationships, we wouldn't have been able to achieve our goals and help others. Second, we always want to respect and learn from every culture. There's always something to learn from a new culture and cultural beliefs should always be respected, both in healthcare and throughout life. Now to carry on from what Lena has mentioned, all the four GLP projects were a symbol of hope that reminded us we can be more impactful if we work together. During the global pandemic, when the need for a global unity is at its greatest, GLP proved that we might be physically distant, but we are never socially apart. So we would like to thank you for listening to our short presentation and we look forward to chatting with you in our Q&A session. Uh, thank you, Alejandra. Um, might I just uh, say now that uh, Q&A will be at the end of the full session, uh, but I'd like to add that this was the video about the GLP, and I didn't get a chance to introduce the students, but you heard their names now, Lena Roy and Delara Mansari. And um, I had the opportunity of being a tutor and a mentor at the GLP this year, and I have to say I was amazingly impressed, impressed by the students' work and the way they handled the whole thing and how well it worked to do it in a digital way. Uh, so let's just continue this session and listen to the students about the Awareness Week, which was also digitally this year. And uh, you will be amazed by the way the students do this and the fantastic work they do. So let's go to the other one, Alexandra. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Hayato and I'm from the University of Melbourne. Uh, for the infographics, each university representative came, came up with their own um, topics that address some aspects of the global goals and did research uh, to raise awareness of these topics. Uh, based on these evidence uh, they provided, we put together a series of infographics and uh, these were presented during the SDG Awareness Week. Um, University of Glasgow um, did a piece on technology and healthcare, uh, which is relevant during this COVID-19 pandemic and how the usage of technology and healthcare settings are uh, evolving rapidly, uh, with examples of uh, quality healthcare being accessed through mobile apps um, that help people uh, manage diabetes and mental health. Um, University of Johannesburg uh, did a piece on maternal mortality uh, comparing South African and global mor mater maternal mortality ratio uh, between 2019 to 2015 and showing how South Africa has lagged behind from the rest of the world and they advocated for much needed improvements in the reduction uh, in maternal mortality. University of Melbourne did a piece on climate uh, emergency uh, highlighting the difference in climate impacts between the global warmings of uh, 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius, uh, with examples of more frequent extreme heat exposure, uh, almost complete destruction of coral reefs, and increased uh, loss of animal species and crop yields. And then Tech de Monterey did a piece on vaccine rollout, uh, advocating for the importance of um, international collaboration and uh, development. Uh, sorry, international collaboration for development and distribution of the COVID-19 vaccines across the world uh, and providing examples uh, and explanations on the different types of vaccinations that are being developed, um, including mRNA, uh, protein subunit vaccines, and vector vaccines. Uh, then we had, um, then we compiled, compiled data uh, from all, our, all of our events to create an Awareness Week summary infographic, uh, which visually represented what group uh, of students across the world was able to do uh, as a collaborative um, effort, um, calling for more involvement by other universities and students uh, to take part in advoca advocating for a better tomorrow. Thank you. I am Professor Catolo, a final year nursing student from the University of Johannesburg and the outgoing Universitas 21 Health Science Group representative for the university. And I am one of the members who was involved in the SDG Awareness Week, which was held in March 2021. In the event, South Africa had the theme, Will South Africa Reach the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030? And in this event, we discussed our achievements as South Africa. Achievements such as improved infrastructure, uh, aspects such as improved access to basic and higher education, um, reduction of hunger by implementing initiatives which um, reduce hunger, such as feeding schemes in our primary schools, uh, and also universities having um, the opportunity to give out food parcels to our higher education students. We also mentioned the fact that in our parliament, 50% of our ministers are female, which ensure that equity is being uh, facilitated in the higher segments of government. And we also mentioned the fact that our president in his tenure as the African Union chair, he ensured that South Africa um, secured vaccines for coronavirus. He ensured that even the continent as well secures vaccines and that it is well prepared to fight um, this pandemic. He also ensured that there is peace and stability in the country. We then dwelled on the factors which might hinder our achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, and this was the South African maternal mortality presented by Tabel Mklum. He then mentioned that as South Africa um, at the time that the SDGs would be implemented, South Africa was sitting at 141 deaths per 100,000 life births. Really a cause for concern because we did not reach 
or achieve the Millennium Development Goals of three quarters uh, deaths per 100,000 life births being reduced. And as the current um, target for the SDGs being 75 per 100,000 life births, South Africa is still fairly high. And the measures that uh, South Africa uh, has put in place to ensure that um, the maternal mortality is reduced is introducing the PMTCT treatment, which is also known as the prevention of mother and child transmission, where mothers are being introduced to the HIV regimen when they're testing positive for HIV, ensuring that there's the best antenatal care for mothers and ensuring that there is family planning for women. But there are challenges still, such as postpartum hemorrhage after cesarean sections due to the fact that we have um, uh, personnel which is not well equipped to deal with postpartum hemorrhage. Also mentioned that there is poor interfacility transportation, which um, increases maternal mortality and reduction of the best postnatal care for our mothers. And uh, another speaker, Mr. Richard Russell Semola, dwelled on the achievements South Africa had, which were the ones we mentioned earlier on, but however emphasized on the challenges that South Africa has, such as the national quadruple burden of uh, diseases in the primary health care settings, such as communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, um, violence, uh, alcohol, and drug abuse. Also mentioned that poor governance really is um, hindering us from achieving the goals and not to mention COVID-19 really. COVID-19 has impacted South Africa greatly because currently our statistics of unemployment sit at 34.4%, which is roughly 7 million South Africans who are without jobs. Really, this then hinders the fact that um, the SDGs uh, would be achieved because it hinders hunger, uh, the SDG that focuses on hunger, uh, that focuses on equity, that focuses on access to education. Really, it affects majority of the SDGs. And it is therefore in this regard that we had come to a conclusion that South Africa will not be able to um, reach the sustainable development goals based on one of the many or few of the many um, uh, crises or situations that South Africa is facing. Thank you. On Awareness Week of 2021, University Tecnológico de Monterrey talked about the advances in COVID-19 vaccinations. This was a presentation given by the Medicine and Health Sciences Dean, Dr. Manuel Perez. A brief introduction about the development of the virus was shown in a compacted timeline, focusing on the news related to our topic. Here we can see why this topic was a priority, and it is still is today, as it affects several of the sustainable developmental goals. By March of 2021, there was no official treatment to cure COVID-19. The best we had to help the population suffering from this disease was support treatment in case of a mild disease, and a few other assistant treatments for those hospitalized patients, but both are based on supplemental care. On the other side, several experimental treatments were being proposed, but none of them show significantly precise evidence. In October of 2020, the antiviral Redemsevir was the only one approved to be used in adult and pediatric patients who have been hospitalized and required supplemental oxygen to treat COVID-19. By March of 2021, 96 vaccines were in clinical trials, while only 13 were officially approved to be used in an emerging state category. The four main types of vaccines were discussed, mRNA, vector factor, protein subunit, and inactivated virus. This shows which mechanism the most popular vaccines use and its respective percentage of immune protection only after applying the second dose. Talking about vaccination campaigns, it is proven that vaccination is a simple, safe, and effective way of protecting the people against diseases, keeping them safe even before they have contact with the virus. By March of 2021, at least 130 countries didn't have the opportunity of giving vaccines to their population, which is why international collaboration is crucial to achieve global vaccination, especially during an emerging pandemic. On Israel, a study was conducted from December of 2020 to February of 2021. And as it can be seen here, the differences are very high, but only after the completed schedule of the vaccine. Same happens with the USA vaccination, where the difference can be seen before and after applying the vaccine. 
Lastly, on March of 2020, the lab Moderna announced that the first vaccine that could be used in infants was on clinical trials. This was a name to protect children since they are six months old. All of these are proof that vaccination and immunization is the strongest strategy we, health caregivers, have for prevention and eradication of a disease. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Christy Craig and I was the Awareness Week coordinator at the University of Glasgow's Global Goals Glasgow for 2020 and 2021. And I also played a large role as well in our social media aspects, um, which was a really exciting and new experience for me. One of the biggest, um, biggest points that we were looking at in terms of getting our Awareness Week up and running was getting the next generation really discussing complex issues in global health settings. And to do this, we sort of took on two different aspects to really make sure that that excelled. And that was discussion events and finding the right speakers. In terms of our discussion events, what we did was um, we found they were really applicable and important because they sort of push students to not only look at the issues at hand, but they actively try to brainstorm and apply their own experiences and knowledges in these situations in order to find possible so um, solutions or new ways to even approach given challenges or whatever it may be that we're discussing. And so they were a really active and vital way to push the next generation to really think about these complex issues in terms of health. Um, we also did a lot of hosting events um, in order to sort of enlighten stu students and demonstrate the challenges in given communities. So this included things like litter runs or lecture events where we had renowned or even just really well educated and or experienced people come together to talk to students about what's currently going on in the world. So a great example of this would be um, the talk that Global Goals Glasgow organized with Professor Sir Michael Marmot, an absolute legend in his field. And he came and he spoke to students and he really inspired so many of us. Or one of the city litter runs that was held in Glasgow prior to COVID where students could come together and see what was impacting our sort of local community in terms of litter and actively search for ways to improve that. And that was picking up, picking up trash. Um, so when recruiting speakers for events, we did our best to ensure that all fields within our university were met to the best of our capabilities in terms of speaker expertise. And that just sort of helped to ensure that not only did our events appeal to our audiences, but they covered a large portion of the sustainable development goals as well. So this meant it was all hands on deck when recruiting speakers. It wasn't left solely to, to me, the Awareness Week coordinator. And that really helped to make our Awareness Week excel and exceed even our own expectations. So that's one of our biggest recommendations, I would say, is it's, it's really a team effort. Anyways, thank you, thank you very much. Hi, my name is Amanda Chen and I am the University of Melbourne Student Representative. I am a doctor of dental surgery student with a strong interest in all areas of sustainability, particularly in how the environment affects human health, their healthcare and vice versa. Our last public event for Sustainability Awareness Week was a casual Netflix style party and Sir David Attenborough's latest document, nature documentary, A Life on Our Planet. This event was jointly organized by our chapter, the University of Melbourne Interprofessional and um, Education and Practice Health Students Network, the Animal Protection Society and Archipel, an Architectural Society committed to the Arts SDGs. So why David Attenborough? Attenborough is famous for his narration of nature documentaries and passion for raising awareness of global environmental issues, such as plastic pollution. His documentaries spark large consumer behavior change, a phenomenon current to Attenborough effect. According to a Global Web Index report, 53% of people surveyed in US and UK reduced their single-use plastic over the last 12 months after watching Blue Planet 2. Over 88% of viewers said they changed their consumer behavior as a result. 60% now regularly use reusable water bottles or coffee cups, and over 70% in 18 to 24 year olds. New regulations claim to be influenced by Attenborough's documentaries. For example, the European Union recently passed a single-use plastic ban. So, in this documentary, over half of it shows the timeline of events that he thinks would happen if we continue on our current trajectory, and the other half proposes solutions. If you want to watch it, you can find it on Netflix, maybe Hulu, and if you're lucky, at the cinema. We also had an optional discussion or workshop to do reflect on the documentary. 
Attenborough and his team provided PowerPoints with questions he wanted to think about. There's one version for community-based groups and another version for arts-based groups. Right. Uh, thank you all for listening to those videos. And uh, I hope you agree with me when I say that the students never cease to amaze us. To amaze us. Uh, and I think we're sort of losing a bit of time here. So I just leave the floor to the next speaker who might be Nadia Dalton, I think. And thanks to all the students who, who uh, participated in the videos and, and um, uh, we come back to the Q and A's at the end of the session. Hi, so Suzanne, we're going to go to Q and A for this session now. That's that's all videos completed for this session. Nadia's is is later. Okay, so I, I thought we decided on doing it at the end of the whole session. So. Uh, there are no questions on the chat, so are there any questions in the room? I think Nadia has a question here, Suzanne, that I can pick up. So it is, um, and uh, to the students present, um, I would be interested to know the challenges experienced by students about the GLP program um, and initiatives, other than the fact that it was a program delivered at a distance. So I can see that we have Delaram. We have Delaram De here, and uh, I think she would be happy to answer that. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, I am here. Lena unfortunately couldn't make it because she her placement was extended at the hospital. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Is that right? Okay, perfect. Um, all right. Um, thanks for that question. Um, I think for me, um, one of the challenges was. Um, kind of discussing or having those conversations with the community over Zoom. Um, I think that was something that was very new to me. Um, doing it um, long distance meant that we couldn't connect to the community as much as we can in person. I think that was one of the biggest challenges. Building friendships, different time zones is another thing as well. Um, trying to actually talk to your group, but someone has to wake up at 3 a.m. to be on the same program, someone at like 6 a.m., someone at night. I think that was another challenge that we faced. Um, but yeah, overall it was really good and it was definitely worth it, especially for someone like myself who when I started the master's program, um, it kind of went to the pandemic and we never got an opportunity to travel around or do global health projects. So this kind of gave us an opportunity to do this, um, even with the challenges that existed. I hope that answers your question. Nadia, did that answer your question? Absolutely. I was amazed to see the, the enthusiasm from the students. Um, you know, even if it's it's normally a very hands-on uh, program on the ground, yeah. on the field, um, on the field, and uh, and you 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 delivered really well on this. Uh, so, well done. Um, it's brilliant. Thank you so much, Delam. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Um, yeah. Great work, Delaram. And we also have Carolyn Cracknell here, who was uh, actually the pro, who is the project manager of the GLP and one of the people working really hard to keep that going. So maybe you'd like to add something, Carolyn, around students, how they sort of manage the digital ways. Um, yeah, thank you, Suzanne. And thank you, Dilaram, for um, sharing there as well. I think it's really important that it's not just me answering on behalf, but from, from the focus groups that we ran with the students, I think there's additionally maybe just those logistics that got a little bit in the way, I guess, the reliability of internet, um, particularly in, in Nepal, just, you know, really was a bit weather dependent and sometimes that interrupted the flow. Um, one thing that I, we recognised we could have done a bit better in, from organising would be giving students a bit more time to connect socially and setting that up a bit ahead of time. So I think some of those um, challenges that maybe we, we didn't anticipate as well, where we've previously relied on the context of that 
been in country where we didn't have that this time, whereas we're shifting that to an online format. But, um, yeah, I think we all heard from Lena and Delaram and we're really happy that we can still achieve such meaningful outcomes despite the challenges. Great. Um, Thank you, Carolyn. Cleona. Uh, yeah, I have a question, Carolyn, and, and for the GLP group. I suppose one of the things that conducting these sort of initiatives online is that it makes the experience more accessible in some ways to students who perhaps couldn't, um, you know, for a variety of, of circumstances and reasons, couldn't travel. And I suppose, have you had the, I know you've recently finished, but have you had the chance to think about going forward, um, you know, you know that you know how we come out of this and we don't want to leave everything that all that innovation that you've created and how we can hold on to some of that to maybe expand participation in the GLP so what what are your thoughts Caroline and, and Delarm as well um I'll jump in first but I'd love um Delarm to share her thoughts on, on this too and I know Jill and, and Louise are in the room too and I'm sure they please <laughs> jump in. Um, I'm sure they have some great thoughts as well. But I think we've recognised that they're, you're right, it was more feasibly, more feasible for students, not just financially, but also managing around uh, their studies as well. Uh, so we were thinking perhaps a hybrid model moving forward um, could, could be put something to potentially look into where students maybe do more preparation work together. So we start that into professional work online um, before going in country when that travel is um, made possible again, or whether if we can get the support for it, I think actually running an online and in country version would be, would be great. There are other universities who are interested in setting up a, the, and running the program with um, as a host university, so in particular um, the University of Malawi and some other contacts in India. So I think being able to offer both options would be really great because running just in country, we run the risk of then being a little too exclusive for students who have um, just a bit more financial backing. And, and the time factor too is, is really challenging with yeah. all the different programs. How do we find the right time of year to run this that actually gives a equitable access across all the U21 universities. So th this could be another way around that too. I seem to remember a comment on the evaluation saying there were students saying, I couldn't afford this if it was, if we were supposed to travel to Nepal. So I think it opened up possibilities for, for some students to actually participate in a good way. We actually have a question here, Delaram, I'm gonna let you in. But um, Sa Sandra Cadenas, she has, she's asking, um, is there any social activities that we can do in the future to improve report online? Sandra, would is you that like a to? Question? Yeah, would you I'll like let to them explain. Elaborate that, Sandra. Yeah, so Vicky has already uh, answered part of my question. So there's there's different online platforms for socialize, and I'm just thinking whenever we have a challenge. How can we resolve it? And I like in the presentations that they said, it's always looking for solutions or perspectives. So one of the challenges they, the students had was having this um, empathy or relation with the community in long distance. So mm. my thought is, what can we do in the future to improve that? Um, and I was, I was curious to know if uh, Nikki knew one of uh, the applications. She, she's been answering. Um, no, that's Vicky. Vicky, I'm sorry. Yeah, Vicky was uh, recommending one. So I don't know if there was one in particular we could check. Um, well, I don't know, actually. So um, do you connect this to the um, to the GLP in a way? So should we let someone know? Yes. On that? So, yes, thank you, Susan. What are you saying, Carolyn or Delaram or Jill or Louisa? I mean, the social, the social activity, yeah, sorry, you go on, Delaram. No, that's all right. I just wanted to confirm that the question is in regards to um, kind of connecting with the community, but um, virtually, is that um, what you were asking, Sandra? I think that was one of the challenges for myself as well, and that was something that I brought up in the focus group, that we should pr probably um, have a chat with the community and see how that went um, for them as well. 
But one of the things I think might actually work would be having an extended GLP. And I know this might not actually work um, with um, the timeline of everybody, but uh, what that will actually give us an opportunity to actually um, have more sessions, even virtually with the community. Um, I should admit that it is really difficult to get the community to join, especially with the internet issues, as right. well as it's a pandemic. Um, being mindful of the fact that we can't get all the community in one room and we have to kind of meet up with everybody separately, that makes it very difficult. Mm -hmm. But I would say like if there was extra time, so we didn't have to rush um, having a program, perhaps we would have had more opportunities to perhaps meet with the community, even virtually. Yeah, I hope that answers that question yes, a little you. bit. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for extending. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dalaram and Sandra. We got a comment from Gillian. You have mm -hmm. to unmute, Gillian. Yes, yeah. yeah, I have. Thanks very much. Sorry, we were late in. Uh, seemed to be yeah, we noticed that. Getting in. Um, I just wondered, everyone's talked about, yes, it gives access to the international students, et cetera, to get there, and that's great. But I think we've also got to think of the local students. Yeah, exactly. Um, because I think they missed out quite a lot on not having the international mm -hmm. students there uh, because that in the past has been one of the major highlights of it. Uh, and so I think a hybrid approach is really good in many ways, but I do think that the whole point of this global learning partnership was that relationship building um, with the university and with the people there. So I think we've got to be a little careful that we don't all say, oh, this is you know, really good because it gets more students in, et cetera, and it's cheaper and things, but we've got to also look at it from the point of view of the, the, the students in, in Nepal, because I think for them, a large part of what they enjoyed in the past has been about people being in their country with them and them getting to know them in that sort of context. So I, I, I just a little, a little bit of caution about overly enthusiastic of it being all online in future. I, I would find that very difficult to, uh, to agree to, I think. I agree with you, Gillian, and I can add that after this uh, course or the project was over, uh, I still joined the group that I mentored uh, and they still kept on talking to each other on WhatsApp and they sent different videos from the different countries so they could keep connected to each other. So they really created small communities in their own, but um, I remember the Nepali students saying they missed out on having the international students there. And mm -hmm. looking at the looking at the chat, Amanda, I think that answered your question, didn't it? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Cleona, how are we up for time? We, we are you, good. We have. Now I just noticed Louisa has her hand up, Suzanne. Yeah, I know. Um, I just wanted to check the time. So yeah, we're okay. Bought. We have another five or six minutes, so we're doing well. Yeah, yeah. great. So Louisa. Yeah. Go. Oh, thank you, Suzanne. And also congratulations to everyone, including the students who made it such an amazing experience uh, with the offsite virtual program. The, the challenge for the Nepali staff is really substantive and they have spoken about that because it's quite a bit of, they were trying to continue with their own work as well as support the programs. It could all be managed with more funding really. And I think Carolyn has raised this. If we can get the funding we need to pay a project officer to manage and support this. It, it would work really, really well as a hybrid model. Uh, increase opportunities, as uh, Vicky was saying, with, student, uh, with students living with disabilities who can't actually fly to places. So there are opportunities both in country and off country. But um, I think it's funds. I, I think we really need to I think um, we need to do with hybrids in the future, that we have some students online yeah. and some students in country, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if, if I may add, the, the feedback from the students, it, it, you really could, lots of pros for on wholly online or a hybrid and, and lots of cons and lots of pros for in person. Um, but, you know, it's really just not feasible and also a, a lot more challenging. So we could d debate this a lot and there's so many things to consider. But I think the fact that we're having these discussions and to get the financial support to explore the best way to move this forward and, and keeping the right people in that collaboration so we can make these things possible is, is super important and 
I think we've started that. And I think just the demands of running it online make this a lot more collaborative between the students and for us as staff um, planning that as well, which I think was um, a, a really good outcome there as well. So, no. Great, Fiona, uh, you're unmuted. Yeah, so just I'm uh, just conscious of time and I, I, I think it's really interesting and I think um, definitely kind of gives us as a, as a group um, a, a key um, objective for the next year in terms of how to um, move, move forward uh, with, with the GLPs is certainly something that we, we will be working on and thanks to you all. I just want to, I have some, I suppose, a, a similar question to the, the students in relation to their awareness week, which was also very, very different this year um, compared where normally students uh, conduct their own awareness week in, in their home universities. And um, I know that Amanda is on the line in Mapaseca as well. And I suppose- Amanda's having question. trouble with her microphone right now, ah, but okay, so, I don't know if she can answer. But I, yeah, so I suppose, yeah, you were going clear. Yeah, so just just a question to in terms of awareness week. So a similar question. It was so successful this year at the online format and really allowed true global learning and partnership and relationships and connections. And I, I just want to you you know ask I suppose, any of the students who are online about oh, what their right. thoughts are about uh, continuing that. I think Map Mapaseca might be with this. Mapaseca is here. Yeah, Mapaseca, would you like to answer that? Uh, yeah, sure. I hope I'm audible enough. Um, so overall, um, I would say that it has been quite a humbling experience, really, uh, being part of the U21 initiative. I must say for South Africa, it was quite a challenging one because, um, well, with South Africa, we have um, infrastructure issues. So connectivity and uh, electricity has been one of the major aspects that sort of um, disadvantage does in a way. However, um, being able to participate in this um, raising awareness really has been quite an amazing experience and journey for the participants and myself really. Uh, and I must say that the health science faculty, especially for UJ, has been particularly proud and we are hoping that more initiatives do come along our way, especially with the article that has been released earlier on and me being one of the co-authors has been truly a, a, a dream come true. So I hope that more initiatives will come and more students will be involved. And um, here, yeah, the more the merrier. <laughs> Thank you, Mapaseka. Uh, and uh, I'm just writing to Amanda, if you would like to add something around Cleona's question around the Awareness Week and being online. Um, she says, you can all read it personally. I think it's time to apply for U21 funding and maybe participate in international projects rise and perhaps the SDG awards. Uh, that's a good thing, thinking and a good thought, I think. And um, although I don't think it answers the question, but <laughs> would, would you consider doing it online again or should we do a hybrid that way? And that, would that be a good idea? Well, I actually don't see if she's typing anything. Uh, is there anything, Cleona, you'd like to add around your thoughts? No, just to say that I'm, uh, you know, I think everything we've heard this morning, um, and as you said at the opening, I, I think the students um, are the heartbeat of, of our group. They, they, you know, keep everything going. And I think just to say, I'm, I'm always, as you said, Suzanne, astounded by, you know, their achievements, um, how, how much, you know, our, our students uh, achieve. And of course, they're students now, but they're the healthcare professionals of the future and, and the leaders of the future. So I just want to congratulate uh, each and every one and also the leadership team for the GLP as well. I think Carolyn and everybody that was involved as well in that uh, hugely successful um, initiative. So, yeah. Yeah, overall, it's an amazing work that is done in this group and the different parts of this group. And, and um, we can all be proud of our work and, and uh, our colleagues doing the work and the uh, never ending sort of enthusiasm that we see. And, and uh, I would like to, for you to uh, talk to your students and make them engage in the student group because the student group is sort of a heart of everything. And without them, we're nothing, I think, because the, the, they are the new change agents and 
listening to them, like I had the opportunity to do this summer in the GRP is, it gives you hope for the future in so many ways. And also the awareness week they did this spring was so amazing. So thank you all students and thank you all colleagues for the great work you do. And Cleona, I leave it over to you now and uh, yes. thank you all for listening to the presentations. Yeah, so thank you, Suzanne, for chairing and facilitating that session. And thank you to all of our speakers and contributors and everybody who asked questions and gave their insights. It's been really great start off and a great kickoff to, to our, 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 our forum today. So right now we have a break. We have a, this is our, we have a half hour break. So wherever you are in the world, it'd be great if you can be back in about 30 minutes. I won't try and attempt time zones. So if you can be back in 29 to 30 minutes for our keynote session, um, uh, that would be fantastic. So we'll ask you to mute, to turn off your cameras. I think you can probably stay logged on um, and we'll see you back here in 29 minutes, okay? Take care, everybody.